All right, super excited for today. Again, uh, you asked for it week one. And so, uh, again, the ultimate goal of this series is to take questions that the congregation has asked uh, about when this comes to uh, just faith in general, okay? Our walks with Jesus, um, who God is, uh, what his intentions are for us, what his scripture really is, what his word is, um, uh, who, who, what God's character is, what about praying, what about all these different things that come with having a relationship with Jesus that can sometimes feel confusing. Can, can faith feel confusing sometimes, church? It can, right? And so today and throughout this series, we're going to do our best as a church to walk through this together as a family and figure out what God's Word really says about it and just bring some clarity to those questions and those confusions. Uh, And so today, I've got a few questions that we're actually going to go through. Um, And so let me show you these questions really quick. So you asked for it week one. Our four questions, uh, why do we hold church on Sunday when historically and biblically the Sabbath is on a Saturday? That's a good question. And then he added, this is Jesus talking, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. That's Matthew 9, 13. What does Jesus mean in this verse? The next question, why do we not keep all the Old Testament commandments when God said to keep them for all your generations? And then the last one, why do we not keep all the feasts listed in Leviticus 23 if Jesus observed them? Why don't we? So these are all great questions, and if we're being real, I said, I, like I just said, we're going to answer these all today. You're like, that's insane, because those can all be preached each in an individual week, amen? We could dig in deep and see what God really says about every single one of those topics, um, but I will say, you guys blew us away. Uh, we received a total of 55 questions, okay? Uh, we don't have 55 weeks to preach this series. <laughs> we could do it, but... <laughs> Woo! So um, we're not. Um, but what we're going to do to kind of make up for that is we're going to take as many of those questions as we can that have a very similar core to them, if that makes sense. Some that really, uh, I think we can dig into one topic in Scripture, one overall uh, topic that covers these questions that can bring about um, a good point, a good idea for us to take to answer those questions better, if that makes sense. We're going to take one big idea and see what God says about those in hopes that it'll help us to have a better answer and clarity to the questions that we have. And so the one that we're going to talk about, kind of our own question that we came up with for today is uh, to encompass these four questions is, is the Old Testament law still important? Okay. Is the Old Testament law still important for us today as followers of Jesus Christ? There's a lot of confusion about this, okay? There's a lot of different ideas as to what that actually is or if it is or if it's not, and different parts of Scripture show different things is what we feel like when we read them. And so we're going to dig into that today and hopefully bring some clarity to that, okay? Uh, So to start off this conversation, I think it's important to talk exactly, just just dig in deep about the law itself, okay? So I want to give just kind of some background information on the law, this Old Testament law that we're talking about, because again, it can be very confusing and bring a lot of twists and turns, and we can all have different feelings about it. So some background on the Old Testament law. First off, you may have read about the Old Testament law um, through a different name, okay? When you read about it, it may be referred to in a different name. So the Old Testament law is one, the Old Covenant. If you've ever read that, you've read the Old Covenant in Scripture. Maybe you've read the Mosaic Law, which is like the law of Moses, right, and the Israelites, and so we see that, or the Leviticus Law, okay? You see it, the Leviticus Law, the Mosaic Law, Old Covenant, or the Old Testament Law. It can be, it's, it's got a quite, quite a few different names, but it's referring to this Old Covenant, this old law that God gave to his people, okay? So that's few different names. Where does it start? Most would think and say like, hey, it starts with the Israelites and Moses at Mount Sinai, right? It's when Moses went up on the mountain. He got these really cool stones that Jesus used, or God used a cricket to like etch in, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> cricket, you know, uh, to etch in all the stuff that needed to be known, things we should and shouldn't do. And then Moses came back down and the Israelites were doing things they shouldn't have already. Um, so technically you're not wrong, okay? Uh, but I think there's actually uh, more and uh, to God's law in regards to time. Uh, so if we look back to Adam and Eve, okay, in the beginning, and this is just a little side note, okay, I think we can actually see with Adam and Eve uh, a beginning of God's, uh, God's bringing about of his covenant and commandment of law, okay, with his people. Because think about Adam and Eve, God gave them a command, don't eat the fruit, right? They did not obey that command that the Father had given them, and so because of that, there was a consequence. They had to leave the Garden of Eden, and so much more came with that, right? And so that's our first experience, I believe, in Scripture of law. God said, 
This is not something you should do. Do all these other things. Don't do this. Human beings broke the law, and because of that, there was a consequence to follow for that law. And if you actually read in scriptures, it's one thing that Josh and I saw as we were reading through is um, that's actually the first time we see a potential moment of sacrifice made to cover the sins uh, because it says that... Uh, God gave them furs. God gave them skins to wear when they left, which means an animal had to be sacrificed for them to take that. So again, I think we go back and we can see that law has been something, right? God has had these, these commandments for his people kind of from the very start. But again, that's just a little sign. If we jump back in, we see that we get this in stone writing of the, the, the laws, of the commandments, um, of these, uh, these boundaries, these guidelines that God has set up for his people with Moses and the Israelites, okay? So at Mount Sinai. And so uh, what we're going to talk about today is, is, is really just part of like, what is this, okay? What is this law that God has given us? Because again, it can be kind of different and hard to understand. But when a lot of us hear biblical law, we just think rules, like, God's just the God that's like, hey, don't do that. You know what I mean? You shouldn't do that just because he's God. And that can be hard to kind of connect with a God who maybe we see as that way or who, who we think is doing that towards his people. Uh, others of us, uh, when we hear about biblical law, it's not just rules. We think again of the Ten Commandments, and we think uh, of just God's way for his people, Right? And when we think of the Ten Commandments, I think it's also important for us to know today that the Ten Commandments is something we see. We watch movies about it. We see all this kind of stuff. But really, there's uh, 613 different laws that make up the Mosaic, the Old Testament law. 613. You're like, wow, that's a lot more than 10. You're right. (laughs) It is a lot more than 10. Um, But that is the laws that God has given his people. And so then what is the Old Testament law really? The law is a set of commandments that God gave his people, some guidelines that they were required to obey as a part of their covenant with their heavenly father, okay? This covenant, this agreement, if you will, between God and his people that they were required to obey to stay in right standing with him. Uh, And so if you know anything about humanity, when we're given rules and laws, we break them. <laughs> uh, I don't know about y'all, but I'm kind of garbage sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, we talked about Forky a long time ago. You know what I mean? Like, you're trash. That's, yeah, we mess up. Can I get an amen? Can any, anybody else in here mess up pretty frequently? You know what I'm saying? I think we all do, right? If you're not raising your hand, we're going to pray for you because we need to. Um, but we all make mistakes. I think we see this a lot uh, when it comes to God giving his people the Old Testament law. We have a tendency to twist uh, the intention, the goal of things. Um, have you ever used a tool or an item for something it was never made to be used for? If you've ever used duct tape, you're, you're supposed to say amen. Come on, you've done it. You know what I'm saying? We take things and use them in ways that they were never meant to be used. We twist the intention of an object or a thing. Sometimes we do this in our relationships. If you ever used a relationship for something it shouldn't have been used for, we set a different goal, a different standard as to what we're trying to achieve through that person, place, or thing, Right? We do this with God's law. So let me give you a little bit of an illustration. Uh, let's, let's talk about a classroom, okay? A teacher and a student. We're going we're gonna to do this real quick, okay? So we have a teacher. Any, any teachers in here? Come on, let's go. Can we make some noise for our teachers? Let's go, teachers. Love you guys. I saw, uh, I think I was at like Dillard's before it closed, but I saw uh, a sign that said, if you're reading this, thank a teacher. So thanks. I appreciate you guys. That's awesome. Um, But the goal of a teacher, we're going to talk about the goal of a teacher for a second. The goal, the real heart that a teacher has is they want their students to learn the subject that they're teaching. They want them to gain knowledge, intelligence. They want their brains to grow and to get more, right? They want to see them grow as an individual and learn the subject that they're teaching. So the method of the teacher to... uh, To achieve that is to teach and to test, to see where their students are, see where else they need help, see where they're struggling at, and to continue to help them learn that subject. So that's the teacher. You got the student on the other side. And if you are a teacher, you know sometimes a student's goal, what they think they're supposed to do in class, is not the same as the teacher's, amen? So the student oftentimes doesn't understand the goal, right? The teacher may say, we're here to learn. They're like, what? (laughs) Learn what? So the student, if they don't understand the goal, they have a tendency to redefine the goal. So instead of learning, in a student's mind, the goal of the class is not to gain knowledge, but the goal of the class is to pass, to get through the class, get the grade needed to get out, okay? Just get through it. So the student's method then, if their goal is just to pass, is they'll do anything necessary, 
They'll cram for tests. You know what I'm saying? I was that, stu- I was a crammer, okay? I was the, the, the student walking to class the day of the test, like, A, B, C, George Washington. You know what I mean? That was just totally me. This is not good. But you cram, you're like, I just got to know the knowledge. And cramming doesn't help you, right? Because you're not, you're not actually gaining knowledge. You're putting it up here for 15 minutes so that when you take the test, you know, and then when you leave, you're like, I have no idea what test I even took, but I'm pretty sure I got to be. And that's what matters, right? So it's like, that's what we do. We cram the knowledge just to get through it, just to pass, because that's what we've turned the goal into. Or if we're being real honest today, we cheat. Come on. Some of y'all like, you know, it's like, hey, bro, move your arm. Let me see your Scantron. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Come on. Is that a B? (laughs) Yeah. Come on. We do these things because, again, the goal is not to learn. The goal is to pass. We've taken the original intention of the class and twisted it into something else. Does that make sense today, church? We do this with God's law. All throughout humanity, we have struggled to keep something at its true intention, to move forward, to achieve the original goal. It's been twisted into something else. And so I want to Take a look at this how we've, and how humanity has done this with God's law. A few examples uh, that involve Jesus, okay? A few moments with Jesus and his disciples and some Pharisees uh, and, and what this kind of twisting of the law looks like. So the first one comes from Mark chapter 2. This is Jesus talking about the Sabbath, okay? Uh, verses 23 through 27. I'm going to read through this. One Sabbath day as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. Disciples are hungry. If you're hungry, you do what? Eat, man. You see it. You see food, you eat food. You're on one of those diets. Those are good diets. You know what I'm saying? You see it, you eat it. So they're starting to eat this food. But the Pharisees said to Jesus, look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? When I, when I look at the Pharisees, I see like a parent following a toddler. You know what I'm saying? It's like when you're a parent of a toddler, you just follow. You know, don't, ah, you know what I mean? They're going to touch them. Don't touch them. Ah. You know what I mean? The Pharisees, when they, they waited for Jesus to like mess up, ah, Jesus, what are you doing? It's like, hey, man. And so here's how Jesus responds to the Pharisees that are just following him. I just see, it's just so if you see him on a line, just like, where's he going? Just turning. It's the Pharisees. They're funny. Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God during the days when Abathar was high priest and broke the law. He broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He also gave some to his companions. Jesus says, hey, you guys think we're breaking the law. You think we're doing something we shouldn't. But don't you remember David, King David, a man after God's own heart, when he was with his companions and they needed food, he took them into this house where only the, with bread where only the high priest was supposed to eat, and he gave them some of that bread. And what David is doing there is he's breaking down priority when it comes to God's law. He's, he's trying to, Jesus is trying to show the Pharisees, hey, God's law is so much more than you think. Okay? God's law is so much more than you understand. There's, there's this value of priority in God's real heart behind the law that you guys just don't quite understand, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. But that's what Jesus says, and then here's how he finishes uh, this part of the Pharisees. He says, Then Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. Okay? So what's going on here? The Pharisees, hey, the Sabbath was made to meet the require, or the people were made to meet the requirements of the Sabbath, Jesus. We're supposed to follow that law. Jesus says, hey, following the law is good, but you have to understand there's a bigger picture behind this. The Sabbath was actually made for us, period. The Sabbath was made as a gift from our Father to his people because a good dad knows when their kid needs rest, right? And a good dad will offer things to them to help their kid to make sure that they can get the rest, that they can keep growing and moving forward, that they don't burn out and break down. So Jesus is saying, hey, you're missing the big heart that God has right here. God's trying to take care of his kids. Don't miss that. So we see, again, this is the first moment we see the Pharisees have taken this law, and it's, again, they're not wrong about the law that was written but they've turned it into something that never was supposed to be. And so Jesus corrects them on that. Does God want our our obedience? Absolutely. But not just for obedience sake. I believe that God wants to provide for us and give us what we need and take care of us. And that's what Jesus reminds them of. The next one is Jesus and the topic of divorce in Matthew 19. This is verse three. So some Pharisees again (laughs) uh, came and tried to trap him with this question, talking to Jesus. Jesus, should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Should a man be able to come up and just go, hey, it's over. You know what I mean? Just like, I'm out. Like, should he be able to do that? Jesus says, haven't you read the scriptures? 
They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Jesus' immediate response is, no. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, Jesus, can, can a man just come and go, no? Jesus is like, no, 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 that's not what God intended. God intended for a man and a woman to come together and be one, and for that unity to never be split apart by anybody or anything. That's God's heart for a marriage. No. And so they, this is where they try to trap Jesus. The Pharisees are like, okay, Jesus, if that's the case, then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away, they asked. Like, okay, Jesus. And you know, I think this is one of those moments where the Pharisees think they got Jesus. Like, oh, really? You think so? And they forget who they're talking to, you know what I'm saying? It's like, what about this? Moses wrote, which he did in the law, that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and it can be done. That's it, right? It's like, okay, that's fair. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus replied, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally intended. The Pharisees, Moses said we can divorce. He said we can write a note and do it. Jesus says no. And the only reason that that was happening at the time is because so many men were going to their wives and just breaking apart the marriage. They were breaking the unity and destroying what God had intended to be something beautiful and kept together forever. So God is saying, hey, Moses knew a priority in that moment and said, hey, I'm trying to protect what God has formed, what God has intended. And so I'm gonna make it harder. You have to get a written notice. You have to do all these steps if you wanna split apart from your your significant other, from your spouse, because we've gotta stop this. You guys have hardened your hearts and are going the wrong way. You're, you're twisting and misinterpreting what God had originally intended. Your hearts were hardened. So we lose sight. Okay, again, in these two examples I see, I think we lose sight of God's true intention uh, uh, of the things that we take and we begin striving towards in a completely different direction than, uh, than God had originally intended for us to do. Uh, and if we're being super honest today, when we do that, we will fail. We cannot succeed. And I think Jesus wants us to see that. And so what I want to do right now is we're going to jump in and talk about the law, okay, a little bit more, just the law as a whole um, and the true intention of the law. So I've got two points about the law that I think are very important and will help us to answer those four questions and our ultimate question of is the, is the Old Testament law still important for us today as followers of Jesus? Uh, so the first point is the law was made to be fulfilled, Okay. The law was made to be fulfilled. So this confusion, there's confusion if you talk to a lot of different Christians. I've had conversations where we talk about the law and Jesus, and like, oh yeah, Jesus came to get rid of the law. It's like, hold on, pump the brakes. Is that really what he did? Because we see this right here in Matthew 5, and Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount. If you've read through the Sermon on the Mount, if you haven't, you should. It's great. But Jesus just gets after it. Okay? He, he starts breaking down so many different topics of the law as a whole and just uh, decisions that we make in life and what the Lord says about them, what the truth is about them. He just gets after it. So Matthew 5, verses 17 through 19, he starts by saying, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Okay? Say, hey, from the get-go, let me just say this and make sure you write this down if you're listening to me. That's what Jesus is saying. He's like, I have not come to abolish the law. So don't think that. Don't take that. That's not, that's not what I have come to do. In fact, I've come to the opposite. He says, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I have come to fulfill the laws that my father has set before me, the, the laws of Mo- Moses, I've, the, the, the Old Testament laws. I've come to fulfill them. He says, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the, not the least stroke of pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished, okay? Not a single thing of the law will be left aside or swept under the rug and seen as unimportant if I've got something to say about it, okay? Until it's all fulfilled and accomplished. That's my goal, is to make sure it's completely taken care of and completed, That's what I'm here to do. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is saying, hey, if you take these and you see them as like insignificant, if you see them as like nothing and and feel comfortable pushing them to the side, you've missed the mark. You've missed the true intention of the Father's heart, or the, the, the Father's intention and heart for the laws, for these commands that he has given us. So, just break down this, this passage of Scripture really quick. So Jesus not only came to fulfill the laws, he didn't want to abolish, he came to fulfill it, um, but also, not only is he fulfilling the laws, if you read through that passage some more, Jesus, he, he adds on, okay? Jesus doesn't just say, hey, fulfill them. He's like, hey, 
you know what, and some. So let me give you some examples real quick. Matthew 5, 21 through 22, Jesus is talking about murder. He says, you have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder, okay? You must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. There's the Old Testament law. Don't murder. You've heard that. Everybody's like, yep, Jesus, we've heard that. We know that. And then he goes on and says, but I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. That, ju- that judgment that you receive from murder, I say, if you're angry with someone in a way you shouldn't be, you also receive that judgment. Jesus is adding on. If you're sitting there, you're like, wait a minute. You know what I mean? This guy's making it harder than it was supposed to be. Matthew 5, 27 through 28, he's talking about adultery. It says, you have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So you're, we think physical, right? We're like, oh, as long as I don't do anything, I'm not touching anything, I'm not doing something I shouldn't physically, we're good. Jesus says, no, 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 you've missed the mark. I say that if you even look at someone and mentally you think in a lustful way towards that person, you receive the same judgment. We've missed the mark. And then he goes on in verse 31. He talks uh, about divorce. Again, you have heard that the law says a man can divorce his wife, like Moses said, by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has become unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. So if you go through divorce in this way, Right? You think just divorce in general. It's like if you go through divorce this way, there's more judgment to it. Jesus adds on. Again, this is just Jesus. I think this is Jesus' moment of going, hey, I'm, I'm not just sitting here just talking, okay? I'm telling you the truth that not only have I come to not abolish the law, but to fulfill it and fulfill it to the fullest extent, every detail, the true intention of the law will be fulfilled. I think that's the point that Jesus is trying to make, that he's come to fulfill it and its, its true purpose uh, completely. So, if Jesus is all about the law, then where does this confusion come from for us? Where does this confusion come from? Because sometimes we read throughout Scripture that Jesus says certain things are unnecessary. We see some of uh, the, the disciples or other people, right, um, the apostles come in and they go, hey, the law is this, and, and Jesus made it this way, so we don't have to worry about this anymore. I think what we're doing is, again, we're, we're twisting the intention. We're, mis, we're misreading. We're not seeing what God's real heart was behind this this law being changed or what it looks like with Jesus. And so what I want to do is I want to break down the Old Testament law into three parts really quick, okay, just to give us a better idea of what's actually happening here. So the Old Testament law break down three different parts. The first one is the ceremonial part. The second is the moral, and the third is judicial. So quickly, just to kind of give you an idea of what I think these were. Uh, so ceremonial is a lot of the sacrifices and actions taken to be in right standing with God. Ceremonies that had to be taken by people in the Old Testament to make sure that they were in a good place with God. Like, not just sacrifices, but different ceremonies to make sure that they were clean. They were able to enter into God's presence. The high priest had to do ceremony after sacrifice after ceremony after sacrifice to make sure that they could be fit to sit into, go into God's present, uh, presence and be there with him, because if not, <laughs> it was a wrap, right? It's like they had to do so many things to make sure that they were fit and able to be in God's presence. So we had to do ceremonies, take sacrifices, and do other actions to make sure we were in right standing with God. That's ceremonial. Moral, I think, is just back to this knowledge of, of of right and wrong, knowing what we are supposed to do and what we are not, not supposed to do, following the commandments and saying, God has called me to not do this, but to do these things. This is what I need to know. What God says is good, what God says is wrong, and I need to obey what he says is good and avoid what he says is wrong, right? Just, just stay away from those things, turn from them, but be obedient in all that I do. That's the moral part. And then the last one, judi- judicial, uh, I think is this, this idea of judgment, okay? Judgment that comes from the decisions that we make. When you make a choice, there's a consequence, amen? Whether good or bad, we make choices and consequences follow. And so for our sin, we have a very heavy consequence that was supposed to be given to us. And so God, in this, or in this law, excuse me, we see that, hey, when you make a choice, even if sacrifices are made, you will experience a consequence. And we see that God shows this. He shows judgment um, uh, upon his people so many times throughout the Old Testament. We, uh, again, Josh and I are talking about this, and it feels sometimes like in the Old Testament, it's like, hey, get this right, or it's like gun to the head, you're in a bad spot. Like, this could be really rough for us. You know what I mean? Like a lady was told, don't turn around, and you're going to be turned into a pillar of salt. It's like she turned around, <laughs> and she got the salt. You know what I'm saying? It's like God was, he's very adamant in saying, hey, th- th- there is consequence, if you're a parent, you know this too. It's like, I've, there's a part of this that is so beneficial for us. So there's, there's this idea of like, okay, ceremonial, the sacrifices, things need to be done to make sure we're right standing, the knowledge of right and wrong, and then again, the judgment. It's like, there's a price to pay and from the choices that we make. 
So why does the church no longer feel the need to, to follow some of these? Because that's kind of how it feels. Again, when Jesus comes in, there's aspects of the law that feel like they're missing compared to how they were in the Old Testament. And if we're supposed to follow the law, because that's what we're talking about today, if the law is important, then, then why does it feel different with Jesus? Here's, here's why I think that is. Uh, so first part is Jesus, became to be the, Jesus came to become the ultimate sacrifice for his people. So Hebrews 10.10 10 says, For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Right? So we look at that sacrificial part of the law. Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. We no longer have to make sacrifices or perform ceremonies or anything like that to be in right standing with the Father because Jesus has already given us that ability. When we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and we receive the free gift of salvation and believe that he did what he did and that he loves us and cares for us, then the sacrifice that needs to be made has already been made. He did it all for all time for every person. So no more sacrifice because he did it. And then the next part, for the, this, this has to do with the judicial part. Jesus paid the price for us all. 1 Peter 2.24, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. So not only was Jesus the sacrifice for us, but again, we deserve judgment. We deserve consequence. But Jesus stepped in and said, I'll pay the price. I'll bear the wounds that you deserve, that we deserve, so that you don't have to. Every single one of them for all of eternity. I'll take it all on me. And so when we look at this broken down aspect of the law in three parts, we see that those first two, for, or the first one and the last one, the ceremonial and the judicial, Jesus is coming and he's, he's brought completion. He's brought fulfillment, right? And again, there's a lot of different ideas and opinions about this, but I believe that Jesus comes in and, and he fulfills exactly like he says he's going to do so that we no longer have to. He offers right standing with the Father freely through him and only through him. So then what that leaves us is that moral part of the law, right? The knowledge, knowing here's what God says, here's the commands of what I should do, what I shouldn't do, and, and, and how to walk these out the right way. That still flows in, and we're going to jump into why I think that is still something that's so important for us, the law as a whole, for us to, uh, to focus on. And so uh, I want to talk about, again, the, the intent, the next intent of the law, then, is not only to fulfill, okay? The law was made to be fulfilled, but the law was made to reveal, Okay. I believe that the Old Testament law was made to reveal stuff to us. So salt and light, we've heard these before in Scripture, right? These are also in the book of Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus talks about salt and light. Here's what he says. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So I think a lot of times when we read this, and I know I've done this too, it's like we hear Jesus go, you're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Like, and you're like, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Jesus. Like all encouraged, you know what I mean? I think that's good. I think he wants to encourage us, but I think he's also reminding us um, of who we're called to be. And not only who we're called to be, but if we're doing it by our own strength and our own way, who we cannot be. I think Jesus is reminding us of our inability to be the people that he's called us to be. It's like, you're the salt of the earth, but you cannot remain salty by yourself. You're the light of the world, but you cannot, rem you cannot remain lit by yourself. You cannot make a difference in this world on your own will, by your own way. You need help. We all need help. Amen? Amen. So let's dig into this a little bit more. I think, I think ultimately what Jesus wants us to see is our need for him, is our absolute need, not just a want, a desire, but our need as humanity to make a difference. We need a savior. Romans 3.19 says, Obviously the law, this is Paul talking, obviously the law applies to those to whom it was given. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. That's a hard statement to hear. You know what I'm saying? It's like he's in here, he's like, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. You know what I mean? It's just back and, back and forth. Everybody's guilty before God. The entire world. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. Again, some confusion there, right? The law simply shows us how sinful we are. That's like, if you're reading scripture one day and you're like, oh, I'm just so excited to dig in and see what God's got for me, and that's what you open up to, it's one of those, you're like, nah, I'm good. I'm just straight for today. I think I'm just gonna, 
think I, I was wrong. <laughs> what, is this the right Bible? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, what translation? That's one of those moments. That's hard truth. Come on, church. We're not so great. We have lots of messiness, and we make lots of mistakes, and we need to be cleaned up. But we can't do it ourselves. We are sinners in need of a Savior. We cannot achieve the goal of the law. Us alone. We cannot be in right standing with God alone. Right? One of God's intentions was, again, to reveal our sin, to prove our inability to be able to keep the laws, to be in right standing for sure, to make it known that no matter how hard we try, no matter how hard we work at it, we cannot succeed in that by ourselves. But that's not where it stops, okay? Here's what Paul says in verse 21 in that same chapter. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with God without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. Can everybody say no matter? Come on, no matter who you are, by faith in Jesus Christ, you were made right with our heavenly Father. Faith in him and him alone. Because of Jesus, our story doesn't just end at, you're no good. Because of Jesus, yes, the law is good because it brings about and shows our sin, and that's a hard truth, but it's important for us to recognize that we are sinners because if we recognize we are sinners, we recognize our need for a Savior. And we recognize our need for a Savior, then we recognize also that He is available and free and says, here, I'm here to love you. I'm here to help you. It's nothing that we have to work towards or get right. It's just to accept and believe. That's it. So God's like, hey, it's not, I'm not just here to tell you that you're messed up. You are, (laughs) but I'm here to help. I'm here to love you. I'm here to provide for you. I'm here to protect you. I'm here to make you new. I'm here to clean you up. I'm here to be your father. I'm here. That's what he wants for us. That's what he's trying to show us. I believe that, again, we miss that intention of the law. I think really one big thing that the law does for us is it reveals God's heart to his people and for his people. It reveals that all along, again, in the Old Testament, things may have felt a lot different. If you're alive back then, that's a different world. You know what I'm saying? But when we look at big picture now, which is the gift that we've been given today, is to see this through the lens of that and through Jesus coming in and doing what he did. We can now see that all along, our Heavenly Father knows what he's doing. Amen? He's got a plan all along. And the whole time, he was thinking about us. The whole time, he was focused on us. He said, I know that you're not going to get this right. But I need you to know you're not going to get this right. So here's some guidelines to show you you're not going to get this right. But I don't just do it to beat you down. I do it because I love you and I want what's best for you. I want to see you grow into the person that I've called you to be because I absolutely have called you to be someone. He wants us to see that. He wants us to see that the only way is through Jesus. He's like, don't worry. I know it seems like, hey, man, this is rough. I can't get this right, God. What's going to happen? He's like, don't worry. My son's coming. And he's going to take care of every single part of it so that you don't have to. That's God's heart for his people. He wants to be in relationship with us forever. He wants to spend eternity with us. He's like, hey, I want to be with you. I want to be around you. I want to, I want to talk with you. And I want you to learn from me. I want, to, I want to hear your voice, and I want you to hear mine. I, I want to do this life together. I want to do eternity together with you. So I'm going to make a way. I'm going to make a way. It's God's heart for his people. So then the next thing is if if that's the case, maybe you're in here thinking this because these are things that hit my mind too. Even as I, I was learning as I was going through this, y'all, this is good. Okay, like just like, ooh, here we go, God. But maybe you're in here thinking, okay, so if that's the case, then if, if, if Jesus has done it, he's completed it, then what's, like, what's the point? Like, if I'm saved, then how does the Old Testament law still have significance in the world today and in my life today? Why should it? If God's already said, hey, you're good, you're covered, then why, why does it matter? Why should it be important to me today? Think about it this way. Let's circle back to the the student-teacher situation, okay? So the student is getting ready to take this class, and imagine you're the student, okay? You are the student, and you're getting ready to take this class, and Jesus comes up, and he goes, here you go. And what he's handing you is every single homework, assignment, test, quiz, all of it, 
completely done. And if Jesus did it, it's an A plus, okay? He's like, here you go. And he hands you every single assignment and says, there you go. The year. Done. You don't even have to work towards it. Complete. And it's all yours. You're like, thanks, Jesus. <laughs> that's sweet, man. You take it. It's like, that's great. That's the gift he gives us for our salvation. He's like, here, you just have to say yes. Here is all the work done, the sacrifices made, right? The debt completely paid once and for all time. Here it is. It's yours. And we just have to say yes. And we've got to believe that he is. We say, yes, Lord, you are good. So we could take that and we could write out our days just being like, well, did it. You know what I mean? Like you can, you can just, I'm not going to go to class. I don't need to learn more. I don't need to, to gain more knowledge. I can just skip it out. I've got my grades. I've got it all. I'm good. One day I just get to go to heaven, it's going to be good. We're solid, right? We could do that. But really what we have is a choice to make. We have to make the choice, is it good enough or should I grow? Is it good enough? Is good enough? Is that, is, am, I, am I going to settle for that or should I choose growth? Because again, yes, Jesus has done it all. He has paid the price. But does he have more for us right here, right now? Is there a difference that needs to be made right here and right now, not just in us, but in the world around us? Good enough or growth? Because I believe that Jesus wants to see us flourish. I believe that Jesus, Jesus wants to see us change the world. I believe God wants to use us in amazing ways to make a difference in, in our lives, in the people around us' lives, and to give him glory. For every day that we, we are alive on this planet, I think those are what he wants for us, from us. Because if we take grace, if we take the gift that God has given us, and we see uh, the law as invaluable, as we see it as something that's unimportant, there's no significance to it, then what happens is the opposite of those things. We won't flourish. We won't grow anymore. We won't become better versions of ourselves. We won't help anyone around us. We won't show people the love of Jesus and, and help them to become free from their bondage and their shame and all the things and, and, and let them know that there's hope for them, that there's grace for them. And most importantly, we won't give God the glory that he deserves because he deserves the glory, amen? And it's, it's on us to show that. God gets his glory no matter what, but he's given us an opportunity to say, hey, let the world know. Let the world know how much I love them. Let them know how good I am. Let them know how, how big of plans I have for them. And we can do that. And I think the, one of the ways that we can do that is by seeing the law that God has set before as important today still. Seeing those, those guidelines, those laws as opportunities to know, hey, if I can do these things, I may have already got the grade, but if I go to class and learn some more, and actually the goal is no longer just to pass because it's already been done for me, but to actually gain knowledge, then I can make a difference. I can change things. God can use me to make this world a better and more beautiful place. But I've got to see those laws, those things, those guidelines that God has given me as valuable got to see them with potential and that they are good, that they're not just a mean God saying, don't do these things because I said so, but they're a loving God who cares for his kids and wants what's best for them. That's who those are from. And so they're good. Um, so my amazing wife, Rachel, she said she's the greatest woman in the world. Yeah, she is. Um, so when Rachel and I, early, early on in our marriage, we, uh, I talk like we're like married for 57 years. It's been six, but uh, early on, back in the day, um, one thing that uh, I had struggled with uh, before our marriage and a little bit into our marriage, just in all honesty, was I struggled with watching pornography. Um, and there was a point where I just like, you know, I mean, it stemmed from childhood and so many other things that um, hit a place in my relationship with God. He's like, hey man, this has got to stop. This can no longer be a thing. It's got to change. Because this is, this is eating at you. This is breaking you down. This is not what I intended for you. This is no good. So I had been breaking the law, right? Been doing things I shouldn't have. And eventually I got to a place with God and he just, he freed me. And it's through a process and over time and I no longer struggle with it. Well, after I even stopped struggling with it, it's like one thing that God had laid on my heart is, hey, you gotta tell your wife about this. You gotta tell your wife because one, uh, in all honesty, there was multiple times that I had lied to Rachel when she'd asked like, hey, is this ever anything you struggled with? Do you ever, it's like something you still did or whatever. It's like, no, 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 because I was embarrassed. I was ashamed. I knew, man, I'm, I messed up and I don't want her to look at me differently. I don't want my wife, the, my best friend, to see me as something, you know what I mean, inappropriate or gross or just differently. I didn't want to lose anything from her. 
And so I was scared and I, it took me seven months, okay? Again, I, I was not, I was, was doing well in that regard um, with temptation and, and, and watching things I shouldn't. I was like, no, I'm done with that. God has freed me from that. But I still had this eating at me. I felt like God was telling me, you still gotta tell Rachel. I was like, come on, God, I'm free though. We're not gonna talk about it, you know? He's like, no, you gotta do this. I was like, okay. So eventually after seven months, um, one night Rachel and I were in the living room. I couldn't tell you the exact day, but we sat down on the couch and, you know, I'm like freaking out like, hey, I'm gonna talk to you. Um, and I told her, I told her what I'd struggled with and I told her I'd lied to her multiple times and done, done things terrible. I broke the law. I had done things that my God had told me I did not need to be doing towards her, against him most importantly, but towards her as well. And you're my immediate thought is she's going to be, again, she's going to hate me. She's going to be angry at me. Whatever you could think, just the worst stuff. I was terrified. Um, but that's not how she responded. When I told Rachel, she had tears in her eyes and she looked at me and she said she loved me. She gave me a hug. She told me she was proud of me. And she was there for me. She was there for me through the whole thing. Said, hey, I forgive you. I love you. And I'm proud of you. Just smile on her face. Even. I was just blown away. The reason I tell you this is because I think Rachel gives us a great example of what happens when we don't just say good enough. We don't just say, I've gotten what I need, so forget everybody else. They've got to figure that stuff out there on their own. But instead goes, hey, I can be a bigger light right now in other places because Rachel showed me forgiveness. Rachel showed me a forgiveness to help me grow in my forgiveness towards others. And a, and, and a compassion and love for somebody that's unconditional, which I also believe because of that, because of what, my, what God did through my wife in that moment and how she was willing to say, God, I want to do more and I want to become more of who you've called me to be, that we can also have an impact on those around us, including our kids, and show them what real forgiveness looks like. That even when somebody messes up and does you wrong or most importantly disobeys the Lord so much and breaks the law, that God still loves them and he's got more for them. That there's always opportunity to grow and to get closer to becoming the people that God has called us to be. But it's a constant surrender. It's fighting to say, God, you've got more. You love me just the way I am, but you always have more. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 17 says, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time we thought Christ merely from a human point, of, we thought of Christ from a human point of view, but how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. A new life. I believe that when we surrender to Jesus, when every day we wake up, we make that ultimate choice, and then every day after that we say, God, I am yours, then he, he changes us. He moves in our hearts. He moves in our lives, and he helps us. He does the work to make us the people he has called us to be. And again, this is all picture of God's heart for his people from the beginning. He wants to see us change for the better. He wants to spend eternity with us. So one last thing, why does it all matter? Why does it matter if we understand the intention of the law? Why is it important? Because when we better understand the law and its intention, then we can better understand God's heart for his people. And when we better understand God's heart for his people, then we become the better version of ourselves that he has called us to be. Can we stand up, church? We're getting ready to pray, and we're getting ready to, or we're getting ready to worship, excuse me, and we're going to have people in the back for prayer, but um, we're going to sing the song Reckless Love one more time, and I want you to think as we, as we sing this lyrics, this is something that God hit me with after first services, this whole thing with the law and then Jesus coming, this whole picture of our lives here is just like we sing. It's our God, our loving Father chasing after us and saying, I want you. I want a relationship with you, and I will fight for it because you matter. You're so important and I love you so much. Can we pray? Jesus, thank you so much for today. God, I thank you that we get to be here in your house worshiping your perfect name. You are a good God and I pray that if, if anything at all today, if we, if we get one thing, God, I pray that we see your heart for us. I pray that we see how much you love us, how much you care for us, how much you've done for us, how much you do for us. You are so good. So Lord, I pray that today we see your law and all the things of the past is opportunity to grow on God. That yes, you've paid the price, God. Yes, you've done the work, God. And we can be in right standing with you if we accept you, Jesus. But Lord, I pray that we see more, God. I pray that we see your heart is for more for us. You want to see us grow. So help us to choose growth. We love you. We praise you. And we thank you. It is in your matchless name we pray. And everybody said, amen. All right, church, let's worship.